Okay, uh, thanks, Shankar, for that intro. So yeah, my name is Nuan. I work as the deputy CTO for the API and integration space. Um, glad to be here after a long time, and uh, thank you for attending this session. So I'll be talking about the different kinds of APIs, uh, what to use, when to use, how to secure, how to rate limit, and so on. So we'll start off with a little bit of introduction into each one of the API types, when to use what, you know, pros and cons of each. Uh, and then we'll go talk a little bit about their specifications and do a little bit of a deep dive into the security aspects of it, the rate limiting aspects of it, and a little bit of complicated stuff towards the end. So let's get started. So as usual, we start off with REST. This is a kind of like the, like the most um, simplest form of um, uh, API available for web service interaction, introduced by Roy Fielding in 2000, and everything in REST uh, is a resource. Uh, so, so you see on the third bullet, uh, get on the employees slash employee ID. So employee slash employee ID represents the uniform resource identifier of that particular employee resource. Get denotes the action on it. So REST maps to the standard HTTP verbs like put, get, post, and so on. Um, so each of those HTTP verbs matches to actions. It's a request response model. Clients makes a request, server response with the data. Pretty straightforward. And because it is based on HTTP, you can have as many intermediaries as you want between your client and your service, such as API gateways, proxy servers, and so on. And you can offload certain aspects of your API to those intermediaries because it is based on HTTP. It is stateless, meaning that all the data you need to process a request needs to be sent from the client, and the server uh, will take the data and response. There is no state shared between requests. It supports HateOS, which is basically about links in resources. So this basically says hypermedia as the engine of application state. So what this means is in, resources, in responses that you get, the server sends links to other resources and actions that you can perform on them so that clients can navigate through those resources and discover um, APIs, right? So this is basically a simple illustration. Uh, so the client sends a request uh, to the server, on, in this case to employees with the department called engineering. This is not technically 100% accurate, the syntax I mean. Uh, basically eliminated certain parts for you know, better uh, uh, presentation. And then the server responds with the data, which is in, in most cases a JSON. Uh, in today's world, right? But REST is not restricted to JSON. You can use XML, plain text, anything you want. Pros, it's very simple, straightforward, right? And um, very easy to implement on the server sides, very flexible, can support any kind of data format. Stateless, which means it's very easy, easy to scale on the server side and load balance and so on. S since it is based on HTTP, you can leverage the benefits of HTTP security. You can use any programming language for the client and server because this is more of an architectural style, right? And because of hyperlinks, hate OS, discoverability, uh, there's a lot of discoverability on your resources. And it's backwards compatible in the sense that if your server changes, does a change that is backwards compatible, the clients do not have to necessarily change. They can keep on working as long as your changes are backwards compatible. So these are some of the uh, good things. Then on the bad side of things, you know, REST does have this overfetching and underfetching problem. So just going back to, the, to this previous one, assume that this example is a case where you actually want the addresses of the employees, right? But you make this request and you get a lot of data, but without the addresses of the employees. So if you want the addresses, you now have to iterate through each of these employees and call the address endpoint over and over again through a loop, right? So Lot of data being exchanged between client and server because of how uh, REST is designed. And there's basically limited support for real-time updates. So if you want events and all, REST uh, doesn't provide a lot of help. Uh, versioning is also complicated because usually in REST, the version is in the URL. So if the server does a version upgrade, or even if it's backwards compatible and it does, does a version bump, your clients could still be using the older version, which basically means that you need to keep this multiple versions running at the same time. So these are some of the complexities of REST. To address some of these, Facebook introduced GraphQL you know, in about 2015. So it's like a declarative style of API. So in REST, you have to basically know how to get the data. It's all about the how. You have the resources, and the client needs to know how to get the data. 
The difference in GraphQL is that in GraphQL, the client doesn't say how to get the data. It just says what it wants, right? So that's the primary difference between REST and GraphQL. So the client says what it wants. It's up to the server to determine how to get it and send it to the client. Key concepts, GraphQL as an SDL, GraphQL schema definition language. Queries are used to fetch data, mutations for updating data, subscriptions for real-time updates. It is strongly typed in the sense that in GraphQL, the schema is enforced. In REST, the schema is not necessarily enforced. It is optionally enforced. So this is basically how it works. Uh, so as you can see in here, the client doesn't iterate through or navigate through the data. It says exactly what it wants. In this case, it says it wants the name and address of employees in the engineering department. It is up to the server to figure out how to fetch that and return it to the client. So in this case, the server has to federate between a database and an API server to get the names and addresses, combine it all together, and send it back to the client. So pros and cons. Obviously, GraphQL eliminates the overfetching and underfetching problem, right? A very efficient use of the network between client and server. Very good for complex data relationships. And because of strong typing, you find errors very early in the development cycle. You don't have to wait till something goes wrong in the production. Um, suppose real-time updates. Uh, the pros, um, oh, sh should be pros and cons. Um, so the server-side implementation is complex. Uh, so as you saw in the, in the picture, uh, the, the server-side is complicated. You have to fetch data from various sources. And because clients now have a lot of power in their hands, it, it is possible in GraphQL that clients may request a lot of data than they actually want. So we'll talk about this uh, in detail in a little bit as well. So it is actually possible to have the overfetching problem if clients are not properly governed. It's, compared to REST, it's a bit hard to understand. Error handling is not as straightforward, because in REST, your errors are mapped to standard HTTP status codes, uh, and therefore it's much simpler. GraphQL is a little bit more complicated. And caching requires more work, because REST operates plainly on HTTP status codes and methods. Uh, caching is very straightforward. You can use like varnish or squid and cache REST responses. GraphQL, you need to do a bit more work. Uh, you can't rely plainly on the HTTP caching. So you may wonder, well, why don't we just use GraphQL all over, right? So that's um, not the right thing to do. There are obviously uh, cases in which REST is better versus cases where GraphQL is better, right? So for simple CRUD operations, REST is the best. For public APIs such as Twilio, where you rely a lot on quick adoption, easy understanding, and quick to get started, REST is probably a better choice. And if you want idempotency, where you want to rely on caching and so on, REST is a better option. And if you want to monetize by number of requests, again, REST is better. And if scale matters, like if your application has a lot of dynamic up and down scaling, REST is probably a better choice as well. GraphQL is good for complex data relationships, where, and in scenarios where clients can actually benefit from querying instead of navigating through your resources. Right? And of course, if it's real-time updates, uh, GraphQL is a better choice. gRPC was introduced as an RPC framework by Google. Uh, so this ut utilizes a binary protocol called uh, protocol buffers for data serialization. Because of this and because gRPC relies on HTTP2, it is very performant compared to HTTP over REST and HTTP over uh, REST over HTTP and GraphQL over HTTP. It's very performant compared to those protocols. It is, again, strongly typed, supports bidirectional communication, client to server, server to client, and of course works across programming languages. So I don't know why every slide says pros and pros. Um, so, it's, uh, so gRPC obviously is highly performant and uh, so strongly typed. And because it is based on HTTP2, which basically means it's based on HTTP, you can leverage the benefits of certain features of HTTP, such as authentication, authorization, and so on, and bidirectional streaming. It's complicated. You need uh, the, uh, and troubleshooting and all is not as straightforward as REST and GraphQL. REST and GraphQL are based on text-based protocols, and therefore, you can easily inspect what's going on. Uh, but gRPC requires a bit more work to troubleshoot. Uh, there's limited client support, like browsers and mobile clients and all. It's not zero. There is a certain level of support available, but uh, not, not a lot. So if you're thinking of end-use applications, gRPC is probably not the best choice, right? 
so any changes you make to the server will break clients unless the clients are compi recompiled and upgraded. So that's another uh, drawback of gRPC. And you know, it, it cannot leverage HTTP caching because it's based on a binary protocol. So uh, it's based on uh, uh, yeah, like text. It's based on a binary protocol, and therefore you can't utilize standard HTTP caching. So just to give you an illustration, in a typical architecture, uh, gRPC would be most probably be used in the back-end side of things, so service-to-service -service communication. Right? So if you have an application that's using HTTP APIs, you would have HTTP APIs at the front and gRPC at the back. So this would kind of be uh, like a typical architecture. Again, nothing set in stone. There are always exceptions to certain cases, but this would be a typical kind of architecture. So WebSockets for client-facing, bidirectional streaming, WebSockets is a better choice, right? So WebSockets, again, is based on HTTP, right? And supports bidirectional streaming. So if you are thinking of end applications, web, mobile, which require, you know, chatty interfaces, right? Server to client, client to server, and so on, WebSockets is a better choice. Now, WebSockets operate on a single HTTP connection. So when a client connects to a service, there's one connection established, and then messages are transferred over that particular connection. REST is different. With REST, for every request you make, you need to establish a connection. Of course, these connections have keep alive, so you may utilize connections for a longer time. But the difference is, uh, um, in, in REST, you may have lots of connections with smaller TTLs. With WebSockets, there are fewer connections, but with larger TTLs. So these are some other differences with, um, in these two. So this is basically how the handshake works. So the client makes a WebSocket request to the server, and if the server supports it, it sends a, a switching protocols response back to the client. And once that handshake is done, the duplex, full duplex communication channel is established, and you can keep uh, talking to each other uh, bidirectionally. Right? And to close the connection, both the client and the server can uh, initiate connection termination. Right? So that's the nature of uh, WebSockets. Webhooks was designed as more of an asynchronous mechanism of pushing updates to clients. So if, I'm, uh, if, if I have a service that is interested in receiving events from um, third-party services or something, WebSockets, uh, Webhooks is a better choice, again, based on HTTP. Um, so I have to, if I am interested in receiving events, I have to open up a port, expose it over URL, register my URL on the event producer side, and when there are event updates on that side, it will call me and inform me saying that there are updates. So it's uh, very good for uh, integrating third-party systems, like GitHub has WebSocket, WebHooks, uh, Salesforce, Twilio. All these systems have WebHooks. So if you want to integrate your software with these kinds of third-party systems, this is probably uh, what you should look at first. So um, the complication here is that publishers have to deal with a lot of complications. So in this case, you have different subscribers subscribing to different, different events, right? So the issue is the publishers or the event producers now have to maintain the list of subscribers, what each of them are subscribed to, and you know, handle errors. So if a subscriber is down, handle errors, retries, and so on, right? So it's, it's a little bit complicated on the publisher side. So, so to solve that problem, WebSub was introduced about six, seven years ago. Now, this addresses that problem by introducing a hub-based architecture. So there is an event hub in the middle, which basically takes off some of the responsibilities of the publisher and into the hub. So this basically simplifies that architecture. So this is simply how it works. There's a hub in the middle. All producers push events to the hub. Hub distributes it to the subscribers. So this way, the publishers don't have to maintain the list of subscribers. The publishers know about a central hub to send events to, and they are distributed by the hub to the subscribers. So that's basically how it solves that problem. So getting into specifications, so as you all know, Open API is the most popular uh, format for describing REST. There is also RAML and API Blueprint as well, but Open API has basically become the de facto choice for REST. Latest version is 3.1. Version 4 is in the works. It's called Project Moonwalk. So if you're interested, you can go to this GitHub location and participate. Um, so it, it's primarily focusing on the impact of AI on APIs, and also the, the, on the asynchronous nature of APIs. So those are the two main targets of version 4. 
uh, to describe asynchronous APIs better. So that's a simple sample over there, uh, a very simple one. Uh, so GraphQL uses the GraphQL schema definition language. So on the left of your screen, you see the query. And on the right, you see the schema. So the schema basically describes what kind of queries and data you have in your uh, system on the service, basically. So here, there's a query called hero, which returns a character object. And then the character object is described below. So character has a field called name, friends, home world, species. And each of those data formats are, are declared below, right? So that's the schema. And then the, we have a query here, which basically requests for uh, the name and friends of uh, um, the name and friends of heroes, right? So that's uh, basically uh, the GraphQL schema definition language. So every field in GraphQL needs to have a resolver on the server side. So if you request for a name, the server needs to have something called a resolver for the name field. Uh, so that is the way how the server knows how to fill the value of that name field. And it applies for everything else, right? For asynchronous APIs like gRPC, WebSockets, WebHooks, WebSub, et cetera, uh, the specification language is called async API. Uh, it has similarities to open API, right? Um, so this is basically how, what we use to describe um, asynchronous or, or event-based API. So you see a small sample here. Uh, this describes, this has information that is useful to both publishers and consumers. Right? So it describes the channels, uh, the events, the schemas, and everything that are useful for both the publishers and the subscribers. Right? So that's about that. So talking about security, so uh, REST security, OAuth 2 is the most popular uh, uh, and widely used protocol for REST. So one beautiful thing about REST is that in REST, you can identify the resource and the action on the resource just by looking at the HTTP uh, method and the resource path. You don't need to decompress the message payload to identify the resource or the action being performed on the resource. And because of this nature, you can offload authentication, authorization, and rate limiting, and a lot of these things to the different intermediaries that are between your client and service, so such as API gateways. So this is why API gateways are quite popular in the REST world, right? So in this case, there's a delete being performed on an employee, right? So you don't have to look at the message payload to figure out what this is doing, right? So therefore, you can offload authentication, authorization decisions to intermediaries. Intermediaries don't have to unpack the message to make those decisions. So gateways can do authentication. Basically, what that means is check if you have a valid key. Authorization, check if you have the right permission to perform that action, and then do rate limiting as well. Now, if you want to go beyond that, now say I have permissions to delete employees because I'm in the HR team, let's say, right? But if you want to implement a rule saying, OK, you can delete employees, but not if the employee is a CEO. Right? So that's like data entitlement. So if you want to get to that level of uh, control, doing it at the service is actually the better choice. Right? So not at an intermediary. You can technically do it at an intermediary, but then you have to keep packing and unpacking messages at different layers of your architecture, which leads to a lot of uh, latency in your request. And also, it kind of binds your intermediaries to your business logic, which is also a bad thing. Right? So that means your intermediaries become coupled with your business logic, which means you can't migrate them, you can't replace them, and so on. Right? So that's a better way to do those kinds of things is right at the service itself. GraphQL is different, because in GraphQL, you can't identify the action or the resource just by looking at the um, method and path. In GraphQL, everything is a post, generally. And the path is usually just slash GraphQL, right? So to identify what is going on, you have actually have to decompress the message, because everything is inside the message. So therefore, securing GraphQL is different. You can do authentication at intermediaries, because authentication is just about you know, checking if you have a valid key. That is fine. But if you want to do authorization, you have to unpack the message, which means it is better done at the service level itself. Again, like I said, technically, it is doable at intermediaries. But you have to do it with caution, because when you are doing that, you are basically unpacking and unpacking the messages at different layers, 
and coupling it with your business logic. So it's complicated. Rate limiting is even more complicated with GraphQL because so why we need rate limiting is to prevent our APIs from being exhausted. Right? So with REST, if you want to exhaust an API, you just have to call it as many times as you can. Right? That's the way to exhaust a REST API. But if you want to exhaust a GraphQL API, you can do it with just one query. Even, right? Because clients can query as much data as you can. So rate limiting GraphQL needs a complete rethought. You, know, you need to prevent the number of requests you are getting. That definitely needs to be done. But that doesn't necessarily protect you from exhaust. Right? Unlike REST. So uh, there are many kind of such issues with GraphQL. Uh, so I picked just two most common of them. One is called the deep query problem. So GraphQL, with GraphQL, you can query very deep. So in this case, this is querying for the manager of a department and the department of a manager and a manager of a department and department of a manager, which can basically keep going on and on and on. Right? So you can go very deep and exhaust your server. Right? So that is one problem. The second example on, on your right-hand side is an example from GitHub's uh, GraphQL API. This is basically querying for the first 50 repositories and um, 10 issues in each of those repositories. So it's basically asking for a lot of data. So the server needs to do a lot of work to send all this data back to the client. So this is like, um, uh, like a large node problem. So to protect against this, you need to do things like limiting your query depth. So you have to set a certain depth, max depth for your queries, and also limit the number of nodes being requested. So these are some of the ways to rate limit uh, GraphQL APIs. So uh, I just thought it might be a good idea to take a small cross-section of a typical application um, in, in action. Right? So this is a very simple application which has a few microservices. So on your top left, you see client applications. These are end-use applications that are using APIs. So these end applications would probably use protocols like REST, GraphQL, WebSockets, um, and access services. Right? So, and because these are end applications, there are probably users involved, logins involved. So OAuth 2 is generally a good protocol to protect these kinds of APIs because of that reason. Then on your top right, there are third-party systems, which sometimes you need to integrate with your um, uh, architectures, with your systems. And uh, these uh, will be uh, like API keys are probably a better way to secure those APIs that you expose for integrating with third-party systems. Because these are not like human systems. There are no humans involved, right? And you can use like OAuth 2 client credentials and so on technically, but in reality, these kinds of systems cannot make an OAuth handshake. So therefore, it's probably better to go with something like API keys or some kind of secret to secure these. And when you're communicating across domains, um, like in this case, domain 1 is communicating to domain 2, REST is a better way to expose those kinds of APIs, and OAuth 2 client credentials flow is a better way to uh, is probably the recommended way to uh, secure those APIs. And if you're talking across, like between services, like on in domain two, there's a REST to gRPC call that you see on your screen. Um, so this is an internal service to service communication. So gRPC is probably the best to secure that. You don't need OAuth 2, uh, the complexities associated with OAuth 2 for that kind of stuff. So again, these are not hard and fast, you know, written in stone. This is like a general recommendation. There are, of course, exceptions to all of these things uh, as we work uh, as is our, you know, industry. So finally, I thought I'll leave you with some thoughts on the Kubernetes declarative, uh, Kubernetes, the Kubernetes API. So the Kubernetes API is a kind of like a funny API. It is a REST API. So if you go through it, you'll see the normal, the REST parts, the, the resources, and so on. But it's kind of like a hack on REST as well, because it doesn't really declare resources as they should be declared in REST. So everything is a kind, and the, the data behind those resources has basically been put into a section called metadata and specs. So it's kind of like a, it's a, it, it takes certain aspects from the REST nature of things, and it takes certain aspects from the GraphQL nature of things and, uh, and provides 
uh, this API. So this, we call this like, like it's a declarative in form, but behind it is, it is actually a REST API. So how it basically works is you declare the desired state of the system. So when you say like OOPCTL apply, uh, what you give in, the, in this file in the service YAML is the declared, is the desired state of the system. In normal REST, when you say create an employee object, the service will create the object and return it back to you. But in this case, it may return a 201, a 202, depending on what you're doing. So what it does is it ac accepts your risk request and gets the system up to the desired state eventually. Right? So that is suitable for systems like Kubernetes because its job is to keep your system up and running no matter what happens uh, in the middle. Right? So uh, this is another uh, innovative kind of uh, way uh, and certainly suitable for certain kind of systems, but not for everything. Right? So um, I thought I'd leave you off uh, with, the thoughts, with a few thoughts on that as well. So that brings me to the uh, conclusion of the presentation. If you have